This is a gentleman who needs no introduction, broadcasting legend Keith Jackson. How you doing today, Mr. Jackson? So so for an eighty five year old. How did you get into broadcasting? Oh, I was laying around on a hospital ship in China and, and turned my ankle around playing baseball and I went down and auditioned uh, for Armed Forces Radio Service and uh, it stayed alive for a while and eventually did a little bit of it and then I got out and went to school at Washington State College back in those days and, and uh, 1950 and uh, eventually wandered into the legend of Edward R. Morrow and uh, I sat there in the same chair he did and sort of liked it and started uh, doing radio programs on the 5,000 watt college station that had been on the air since 1928 and produced a lot of good people. And so I gave up a double major of police and political science and possibility of a career in the Marines and became a broadcaster. Now, how does a guy who grew up in Georgia end up going to college in the Northwest. Well, I did four years, a little over four years in the Marine Corps. A deadly piece of it in China. And uh, they had the, uh, the uh, subjects I wanted to study. And it was one of the few schools in the country that would let you take a double major in police and political science. And August Balmer had just started uh, the police science programs out at Berkeley in California. UC Berkeley and uh, and Washington State uh, was going right along with it, and it seemed to, it felt good. Five of us went, and uh, four of us graduated from there. I'm only 42, but I heard about Edward Murrow. What was it like to work with him? I never worked with him. He's long since gone. Uh, Ed Murrow came from uh, out of history, and his place in history is that uh, if you can be in the right place at the right time during a war, he was. He was in London, and he had this great voice. He came out of Colfax, Washington, and uh, he had uh, a, a voice that resounded, echoed off every corner in the room, I think, when he, he did a broadcast. Cause he, he was also very bright, very opinionated, and uh, very seldom uh, wrong. And uh, he he went on through, uh, carved uh, a, a historic career. He went through that McCarthy thing and all of that other stuff. Mm -hmm. And uh, is, is absolutely a legend in broadcast news. Great voice. Your, your grandpa, grandparents would remember it. And that voice would come through it. This is London. And you yeah. couldn't mistake who it was. Well, those were the days when it, it seemed that the CBS had a, a core of radio broadcasters, of Walter Cronkite among them, and Eric Severide, and on and on, who were just f phenomenal, for lack of a better adjective. And uh, they made the transition from radio, many of them, to television. And uh, which is where some of us got got to know the likes of a Walter Cronkite or an Edward R. Murrow or Eric Severide or, or some of the others. It, it, they were able to t to take the one craft of radio and and transform it into this relatively new technology of television. Well, uh, there's several reasons for that. Uh, I think people who uh, really are in in line for a career in journalism as such, uh, profit from having been in radio. I think everybody should have to do some radio instead of just walking off uh, uh, the campus and, and going straight into broadcasting and thinking that uh, they've got a grip on things. I happen to think you have to learn to write before you can talk. <laughs> Myself, I, I think that's the greatest. That's where you build your vocabulary. That's where you, uh, that's where you learn to turn a phrase. And uh, like it's been said many times before, if you can 
turn a phrase and make it interesting enough, even if they don't know what you're talking about, if they like what you said, they'll look it up. No question about that. Now, when you called a, a radio play-by-play for Stanford and Washington State in 52, was that your first play-by-play experience? It was my first uh, college football broadcast. Okay. I'd done I've, a lot I've, of high school stuff. But, uh... I've always marveled at people who are able to do the radio play-by-play. Are you born with a certain gene that enables you to describe what's going on in the field? Well, I was born a slow walking, slow talking Southern boy. I don't, uh, <laughs> but I had, um, I had that in my soul from, I guess, the day I was born. And it's a true story that when I was about 10 years old and my my mother was a registered nurse and was oftentimes away during much of the day at the hospital. And and my I lived uh, more with my grandmother, and uh, she had a, a small farm down there in West Georgia, and that's that's where I lived and worked. And uh, my grandmother said to her mom as she came in uh, that night that you better go talk to your son because he's out there in the field working and talking to himself. <laughs> all day long and uh, she did she came in and quizzed about it I guess I, I don't remember it vividly and uh, and as the legend goes and you can say almost anything you want I guess in the legend but uh, she said wanted to know what what this talking business was out there in the field by myself and I said that's not talking business I'm calling football games <laughs> and baseball games and I was. See, back in those days when I grew up, I rode a horse to high school. A horse I broke myself. Uh, I, I did all kind of bucolic things that that most people don't know about these days. And um, and uh, you uh, you had to find a way to amuse yourself because you spent a lot of time by yourself. Mm-hmm. And. Um, I love to write. I, there's still some scribblings around somewhere, I suppose, in somebody's trunk. But when I was 10, 11, 12 years old, I was writing stories. And um, it was just in me. We're all made to do something, and uh, uh, the, the best part of life can come if you can find your where you fit best. And fortunately, I found it. How did you end up covering an event in the Soviet Union in the late 50s? Well, I was working at uh, Channel 4 in Seattle, KOMO television and radio, and uh, doing Pacific Coast League baseball, Seattle University basketball, Husky football, and uh, and news. Got to have our news every night on television. And uh, the... Uh, the University of Washington got caught in the football slush fund. Some businessmen and alumni downtown had put together a pretty good sized fund and it was some twenty five or thirty years later that Hugh McElhaney finally admitted one night uh, on live television that he took a pay cut to go to the forty niners so uh you uh there was a there was a hell, big hullabaloo about it. Uh, the NCAA came down like a fallen wall on them and penalized the entire university's athletic programs. And the rowing stewards who owned the building where the crew worked and and uh, shell house and what have you, and that land, they were terribly indignant that they were included in the penalty. And told the NCAA to go to hell in a handbasket, and they went in their pockets and raised some, a bunch of money and sent the crew, which was a very good crew that year. Um, they sent them to Henley. The Henley Royal Regatta, of course, is one of the premier sports events. It was then, and I presume still is, uh, in uh, the old country. There's about a 2,500-meter um, straight stretch of the Thames River, uh, just uh, a little bit outside of that Henley on Thames community, and it's one of the big fashion shows uh, of the summertime. 
And so the Huskies were sent over there by the uh, rolling stewards uh, as a reward for having had an undefeated season. And they went, I went. I talked the boss into letting the cameraman, hired Romali and I go. And uh, then uh, the, the two newspapers jumped in with their two editors, Royal Brougham and George Myers, and we all went to Henley on Thames. And they rode the Russians in the final, the, the, uh, the eight, eight oared boats and uh, the Soviets, and the Soviets beat the tar out of them. I mean, there was just open water, and it was conducted in a howling thunderstorm, very dramatic. And I had the privilege uh, then, uh, speaking of, of picking up information along your path of life, uh, I worked with John Snag, who was was the man in all of England back in those days. And uh, John was out in the boat uh, half drowning in the thunderstorm and saying, by God, I made a poor decision on this day. <laughs> but um, anyway, the Russian, uh, the Soviets then uh, beat the Huskies pretty badly, and everybody's down in the mouth and what have you, but we broadcasted on radio, and uh, you didn't fiddle around with television because it wasn't available back in those days, and uh, it was 55, I guess it was, and uh, then one, uh, two days later, there was a young fellow with a blue serge chute standing uh, four feet from Al Ulbrichson, the Husky rowing coach, and he said he introduced himself as uh, representing the cultural exchange program that had been an ongoing conversation between the United States and the Soviet Union, in which they would uh, swap things. And he said to Al, uh, well, Coach, would you like another shot at the Soviets? We'd be happy to have you go to to uh, the Soviet Union as the first American athletes to participate in our cultural exchange program. and. Al almost uh, fell in the river. He was so surprised <laughs> to get that invitation and, and was so eager to accept it. So here I'm standing about 40 feet from him, eavesdropping on that conversation, and I'm trying to figure out how I'm going to shirt tail him and go with him, with Howard, the cameraman. And uh, <clears throat> the only in tourist office, this is a wonderful story, but it goes on forever, the only in tourist office in the western part of the world was in London, and it was run by one woman, one lady, and a very jolly, happy kind of a person. And uh, we, she loved Wheeler's Fish House, and I probably spent, I don't know, a thousand dollars buying her martinis and fish, and, and uh, the other guys pitched in when I got tired. And. Uh, Finally, one day she called and uh, at the um, house where we were staying out at Headley, and uh, she said, "If you can bring me thirty-five dollars U.S. cash money per day per person, I'll get you a visa." So we were able to scrounge up the money. The uh, folks in Seattle kind of hummed and hawed a little bit before they coughed up quite a bit of money. But the, they did it because by that time it had become quite a story out in the West. And uh, sure enough, we went there and went through all kinds of, uh, of travail and troubles. Irving R. Levine was a wonderful help to us. Irv was the NBC correspondent uh, at that time, and we were an NBC radio and television station in Seattle at that time. And uh, finally, we, we got permission. Uh, to do it, but you, you're going to love. You got. I got to tell you this part of the story: that we went out to the Kim Kinska Reservoir, having made all the uh, arrangements for broadcast. And um, there was a lady who ran uh, Moscow Radio at the time too. And we'd go out there with a professor from the university uh, who was our guide and and uh, and translator. And we go to the main gate, and there are two ladies, each with a rifle on their shoulder and pistol on their hip and a very bad attitude toward Americans. <laughs> no way in tarnation were we going to get inside that reservoir. Nyet, 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 everywhere you turn. And Yuri Kolosov, who was our uh, translator, kept saying, we need paper, we need a paper with a stamp. 
And this little dance goes on for a whole day and into the next day, and, and still nothing but nyet. And the foreign ministry guy wasn't helping us a damn bit. He, he was trying to hide from it because he was afraid he was going to get in trouble. And uh, finally, Howard Romaley, bless his heart, who's now passed, uh, Howard reached into his wallet and he comes out with a Seattle police and fire department press card which had a notary public on it and showed it to the woman and she opened the gate. <laughs> That's how we got in. <laughs> with a Seattle police and fire department press card with a notary public stamp. They went out there the next day and did a half hour broadcast and they timed us right to the minute and the Huskies only needed about 27 minutes to row the Soviets dead in their seat, whipped them right in their backyard, and life was good. <coughs> Amazing. So that's the long, uh, drawn-out thing, but still, it was filled with anticipation, and we were. that was also the week. If you wonder why there was such keen uh, interest in that part of the world, that was the time when Marines were landing, U.S. Marines were landing in Lebanon. The Brits were sinking ships in the Suez Canal, and it was pretty dicey-looking time. Yeah. But um, as far as we were concerned, uh, we won everything when the kids went out there and, and whacked the Soviets in their backyard. So how does a guy in the Pacific Northwest become a national broadcaster? You know, it seems like, from my recollection, it was usually some guy who was on a TV station in New York and ends up doing national broadcasts. Oh, that's true. Yeah, if you weren't, weren't in New York, uh, you're, you're climbing a slick tree. And uh, Seattle, if you know your geography, is, is, is isolated from the rest of the country because of the mountain range. First you got the Rockies, and then you got uh, uh, the Cascades. And they're, they're formidable opponents when you're moving goods and, and commerce and what have you. But I, how do you get there? I don't know. I guess be good enough. That's the only answer I can give you. <clears throat> we were, we got a goodly bit of acclaim from the Soviet adventure, and uh, by then uh, I was doing news and continued to do news as well as sports, and uh, we did several things that were carried on uh, on NBC, and uh, people saw them, and then one day uh, the call came from Los Angeles. How would you like to come down to Los Angeles and be ready to do a radio news program? every night and uh and you can freelance sports when you have time and uh, so i did I, during the end my wife of 61 years we talked a long time about it and uh, decided uh, that if we were going to ever do it it was time and so we moved and you were covering the afl which was the new league the nfl's opponent what was that like that was about like the USFL. I did that too. It uh, well, it was pretty clear that um, there were boys with uh, pockets full of money scattered amongst the the tribes, and um, they were tired of this same little group of people making a lot of money with professional sports, and and eventually there came that that seed. Uh, the, the desire to to join the chase, and uh, that's how the AFL came along, and led by Lamar Hunt and a few people like that. And they, you know, they knew what they were doing too, and caught on, and uh, you have what you have now. Now you've done a, a wide variety of sports. I'm I'm curious what it was like to have been at the Munich Olympics in 1972. Oh, it was heartbreaking. 
uh, sickening. And uh, even though I'd run around over a good piece of the world by that time and realized uh, uh, it, it wasn't uh, overwhelmed with common sense, uh, no part of it. Uh, it was just it was just mind-boggling. It was hard to understand why this could happen. Because if it not happened, I submit that that would have gone down as one of the great Olympics of all time. I mean, Gemütlichkeit was rampant. Everybody was happy. Everything was going perfectly, just like the Germans planned it, and on and on and on. But uh, suddenly uh, there was this dreadful thing. But the more you think about it and the more you look at it and study why this might have happened, they didn't think it up by themselves. Do you remember Mexico? Yeah. What happened in Mexico? In Mexico City with uh, uh, the Black Power with Tommy Smith. The Black and Power. That was an American problem that was taken by Americans to Mexico City and put smack dab in Mexico, Mexico's Olympic Games and uh, uninvited. And then suddenly, bingo, here across the world comes the idea that that's a great stage to perform on. Boys, let's get ready for 72. Yeah. Because Mexico was in 68. No, you're absolutely right. Was there a, a football game that stood out that you think was the best one you ever covered? Yeah, several good ones. Uh, it's, it's very difficult and, and, and really kind of silly to try to say this was the best one. But I'll make a tip. Uh, the one I've always cited was the 1967 USC UCLA game in the Coliseum with the national championship, the conference championship, the Rose Bowl, and the Heisman Trophy all on the line. The Trojans won the championships, and Gary Beban of UCLA won the Heisman, and it was 21 to 20. Pretty good stuff. Not bad. And when you were doing college football, when ABC was broadcasting a game, that was like the, pretty much the game to watch as opposed to nowadays when it seems like there's 20 or 30 games on any given Saturday. When ABC came to a college town, that somehow validated that school or that fan base. And it, it, it's tough to describe to people nowadays what that was like 30 or 40 years ago. But, uh, you know... Here's Keith Jackson coming to Columbia, Missouri, or wherever it might be, or you know, Austin, Texas. And okay, well, you know. I, I never felt, I never, never pursued it, nor did I ever feel that I was the bell cow, because we had an awful lot of very talented young people and some middle-aged folks like me, who uh, worked awfully hard to make that worthy of the attention that it was getting. And we knew that if we continued to do it well, that uh, other folks would have a hard time uh, taking it away from us. And uh, they did, but they eventually got there. And, uh, and most of us, uh, most of us are no longer, ABC is gone, you know, ABC Sports is gone. Right. No, it's ESPN. I mean, growing up, being 42, I remember college football was ABC, Saturday afternoons with Keith Jackson, and then mm-hmm. on Monday nights, it was Monday Night Football with Howard Cosell. Well, that's right. Yep. But you guys were like polar opposites. I mean, you were the ultimate professional where Howard Cosell kind of, he was a professional, but he always basically expressed his opinion. He wasn't afraid to do it. Well... <laughs> He was, he was a bona fide, and I guess justified in hindsight, uh, uh, special kind of dude wandering around the landscape and getting away with things that, that uh, probably nobody else could. 
and uh, he was uh, <coughs> he was Rune Arledge's. Uh, he he lit the road in front of a lot of things that Rune wanted to do, and uh, and the best thing probably that ever happened uh, for Howard was when they started throwing bricks at the television sets in the bar in Denver. <laughs> I mean, that kind of nonsense just gets you more attention in the media. And I I, think, a lot of guys were grumbling and griping about him and all of that kind of stuff, but uh, he gave them, he even gave the, the media more uh, reason to write stories about him than any man I've ever seen. Yeah. <clears throat> well, it, it seems I like... Him. I had a guy at a yeah. ball with him. I had, more, I had a oh, ton of fun. Working 18 years of time. Because, I mean, the standard was the broadcasters should not make themselves part of the story. And Howard, basically, he was part of the news. Well, of course. That was the plan. Howard's the only man I've ever known that could do a, do a, a 15 minute memory piece about a guy who just died who he didn't know. <laughs> Now, you somehow were able to stay almost in the background of a broadcast so that the viewer could enjoy the game and at the same time listen to you and come away more informed than they were beforehand. Nowadays, it, it seems like a, bro a lot of broadcasters are more interested in themselves than in what's going on on the playing field. Well, I have a very firm philosophy about that. In the first place, uh, the field belongs to the players and the coaches. Not to some guy sitting up in the crow's nest up there uh, running his mouth and trying to make a name for himself. My philosophy was, is, and will always be when it's an event like that, a public event, that is being covered by public media, you amplify, you clarify, you punctuate, and stay the hell out of the way. No, you're... I lived with it then, and I live with it now. So <laughs> there you go. No, you're exactly right, and you work with some great broadcasters, and some of them still broadcast today, like Dan Fouts and Bob Greasy and Lynn Swan. But again, I think they had some more philosophies to you. Well, all those guys worked with me. Grace uh, was with me 12 years. Bouncy was, uh, I think, seven or eight, maybe nine. And, of course, Swanee, he uh, was a good sideline guy. Now, you know who was a wonderful sideline reporter that we had with us for a good long time and went on to a, an a still-going uh, career? is Tim Brent. Mm -hmm. Tim Brent was an all-conference football player, defensive end and linebacker at Maryland. But uh, he was studying broadcasting. That was going to be his career. And uh, he, he, from the get-go, worked on it. And he had the ability to uh, capsulize a story quicker than, uh, I think, more than anybody I know that worked the sidelines and I have another guy we talked to last week. I forgot Frank Broyles. Well, Frank was just pure fun. I mean, he was a great football coach and uh, and was more fun than you can believe just just to hang out with. <laughs> he was he was great. And uh, Frank and I grew up about uh, forty miles from each other, in West Georgia. He was in Decatur. He was city boy, and I was a farmer. We never met until uh, well, he was playing at Georgia Tech, and and I was uh, off to the Marines, and um, and uh, we finally got together, <laughs> had some great times. But there was a lot of grumbling around the Big Ten country about uh, two Southern boys working in the national football game, and it was hard for us to to, to travel that tight line and not let people know where we came from, but. By then, it had sort of become fashionable to have a, a, a little southern lilt sometimes to a, a sports broadcast. Think back over 
uh, think back over the biggest names you can think of in the history of sports in New York City. And you have to go to baseball more than anything else because they didn't have hockey down south. But who were the no. great baseball announcers in New York City? He had a couple of southern boys in uh, Red Barber and Mel Allen. That's right. They had an influence on Vince Scully, who came out of Fordham. <laughs> but um, uh, Mel Allen uh, uh, grew up about uh, four blocks from Legion Field in Birmingham. They do things uh, better in the uh, bigger and better in the South. Well. Uh, it was just the formation uh, of the of the uh, colloquial language. They just talked differently, but and in, they had a they had a freedom uh, about the way they expressed themselves, and uh, they didn't. Uh, Bill Mundy, for for example, I stole absolutely admit completely and clearly that I stole the line about, Lord, he's on his way to Hallelujah Land. That meant touchdown in Bill's vocabulary. Uh, I mean, but you talk about turning a phrase. That's a phrase. I don't think you listen. No, well, and I, and where I do think we, the phrase m most people associate you with is "woe Nelly," and and the origins of that trace back well, to your that's childhood. A, that's. Um, that's an overrated and overstated thing. I, I don't know why. I guess it was just they had they been looking for something to to whack me over the head with to hang on me, and, and that was it. But um, the uh, it, it really there was a guy out here in Glendale in the early days of television who did the uh, what do you call it women's skating, and uh, and uh, the, there's this some folks out in Glendale who still accused me of stealing that that O'Nelly line from him. And I, I never met the guy, and then and it was long since he was gone by the time I came to town, I guess. But um, he worked for the Gene Autry station here, Channel 5, in Los Angeles, which was the original television station. And um, But the, uh, the O'Nelly, as far as I'm concerned, came from my great-grandfather. Uh, Jeff Davis Robinson, which is uh, R O B I S O N, different spelling of it, because he was uh, Irish. And then somebody said Scott, and eventually they proved that uh, that particular group did come from Scotland. But anyway, he was a whistler, and he would sort of like that, never really outright whistling, just sort of. And uh, he's he a small little farm, and he worked hard, and, and he was a great storyteller and all of that. But his the other part of his personal expression while he was fussing with things and trying to make something work was, and when it didn't go, he was oftentimes heard to say, call Nelly, as, as an expression of, damn it. Because <laughs> every time he cussed, Grandma got after him. But uh, they... Um, that's where mine came from, and, and I don't care whether anybody believes it or wants to know it or anything else. <laughs> if they don't want to know it, don't ask. <laughs> Did you have a favorite sport to cover? Uh, well, I, I, I had a, a, some of the most fun of my life doing Pacific Coast League baseball. And this was back in the days when they had the big home run hitters and all that kind of stuff. I had some great players, and they would go from Los Angeles to Cincinnati, and they'd go here, there, and everywhere. And they, Bill Co, of course, was one of the bigger names because this huge mountain of a man could almost one-handed swat one out of anybody's stadium. But uh, baseball is a game of geometry. Everything about baseball is 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 really a, a, a angle. It's a game of angles and, and all of that stuff. I mean, you just have all kinds of fun with it. And uh, that was the game that we played down south. We had uh, the Nashville Bears and the Atlanta Crackers and the Birmingham Barons and and uh, on and on and on. And uh, But no major league. There was no major league sports in the south until really 
uh, after the, the big war, Second War. Yeah, the most famous cracker was Charlie Trippy. Charlie came from Pottstown, Pennsylvania. And he was uh, recruited by the Bulldogs, and uh, and he, he his fame really began uh, um, when uh, the Georgia and I guess it was forty three was when I really got tied into the Rose Bowl. Georgia came out and played UCLA, and UCLA had Bob Waterfield and a great team, and uh, uh, Charlie Trippy was the backup tailback. And a really good one. And Frankie Sankwich was the starter, but Frankie had sprained an ankle, bad bad sprain. And uh, Charlie Trippy was the uh, MVP in the Rose Bowl game. Georgia won the ball game nine to nothing, and uh, they, the Trippy was sent into the game to score the touchdown, and he jumped over the top and got it. And uh, and the, so they shut out UCLA, and then Trippy after that. Uh, arrival on the national vision went on to play with the uh, Chicago Cardinals where he was a triple threater. He played defense, he, he ran the ball, he threw the ball, he punted, he did everything. He was, he was a great, uh, great player. He was part of the original million dollar backfield with him and what, Ali Matson and those guys? Well, Charlie preceded Ollie, I think, a little bit, because Ollie was... Um, a little after. Yeah. yeah. Played San Francisco. The, now, the boys out in the West are getting their, uh, hitching their britches up pretty good, though. They're going to be a pretty good conference next year, I think. How did you start calling the Rose Bowl the uh, granddaddy of them all? Because it was the oldest. It was the first one. Just another way of uh, describing, giving it its place. Did you realize when you came up with that phrase that that, that was something that's going to live on forever? Nope. I had no thought of it. Really never gave it any thought. All the years that I was out here, living out here, uh, we've been in the same house down in the Los Angeles area for 46 years now. So uh, I never thought about calling it granddaddy, but other people did. And, and the, the fact that uh, I may or may not have, I don't know. I can't say to you that that, that was written down and, and clutched to the bosom until I felt there was a, a key time or an important time to use it. I, those, those things just pop out. The spontaneity of the moment is what makes it worthwhile. But I'm not uh, a purveyor of uh, pearls. <laughs> if something, uh, if, if it's if it's something that fits the circumstance, then use it. I give you credit, though. Your last game you called was at 2006 Rose Bowl with Texas and Southern Cal, and then you decided to walk away. I did. My candle was burned. I had worked 50, what, 54 years plus four in the Marines. I'd worked a long time. And But that was a great game. I never saw a quarterback perform like Vince Young did that day. Yeah, but he got away with a free touchdown that was <laughs> illegal, and uh, I'm still burned about that. Not because of, <laughs> of Vince Young. I, I, I just... That that would have gone down truly and genuinely as one of the great, great football games of all time. The individual performance plus all the rest of it. And uh, it was marred by just sloppy work by the replay crew. When Dave Perry, who was head of the National Officials Associations, was sitting six feet behind me in the broadcast booth. And every year at the Rose Bowl, that's where he was. And when that play happened, uh, Vince's knee was on the ground. He pitched the ball forward. And there were th we figured there were three fouls on the one play. 
And, uh, and if you looked at it hard enough, you, you could find a couple of holdings and make a half a dozen. But uh, why? why? Why were the replay officials not involved in this? It was blatantly clear that there were fouls. And we're sitting up there replaying it and replaying it and replay it. And finally, Dave Perry went down the hall, and by rule, he was not allowed to go into the room and converse with the replay officials, despite the fact that he was the number one. And I couldn't do anything until it was over. So he comes back, and he says, well, they said they were plugged into the wrong uh, uh, recorder and didn't have it. And my reaction to that was, why in the hell didn't they open the door? We played it 28 times. And I still haven't gotten an answer. (laughs) (laughs) Now, um, among your broadcast partners were Dick Vitale and Bill Russell. Have there ever been two more polar opposites than those two? No. In terms of demeanor? Not to my knowledge. I, I uh, Dick was a perfect example uh, of letting his enthusiasm uh, uh, maybe run away with him at, at times. I don't know. I'm, it's none, none of my business. But uh, he is also an example of, of how you can make yourself a career up in the booth. Bill Russell, on the other hand, in my mind, was one of the smartest people I've ever worked with or been around, and I was around him a lot because I considered him a friend uh, all the time that uh, that uh, he was uh, working with us. And uh, a lot of things about Bill Russell that, uh, that caused me to say that because when Bill finished his career and he went through that smutty thing in Boston with all of that, that trouble and what have you, and... Uh, I was part of, I needled a couple of uh, columnists in Seattle newspapers to write Sam Schulman a letter, an open letter, and say uh, the Sonics needed a coach that could move that basketball franchise because it had just become a, a meaningful NBA property, and hire Bill Russell. He's forgotten more basketball probably than half of the guys that are out there now. And lo and behold, the very next year, he hired him. And uh, Russ, uh, I don't think, I don't know if he'd ever say it or not, but I, 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 I'll say it for him. But I'm not sure that he was ever all that happy being an NBA coach, despite his all of his... He couldn't understand why a professional athlete, every day that he went out there, being paid a pretty good money, why he wouldn't sell out every time he was on that court. Full effort, full effort, full effort. And uh, it used to frustrate him a little bit. And he didn't coach all that long, if you remember. No, exactly. But I'm still, still very fond of him. Hello. He's a very smart man. No, you're right. I mean, the situation with Russell is, I mean, you talk to former basketball players, they said he was one of the greatest of all time because he was such a competitor and so intelligent. Well, the other thing about, that I admired about him was when he finished finished playing and all that stuff, he bought himself a motorcycle, put a sleeping bag on the back, if you can imagine this, a six foot nine guy coming down the road on a motorcycle. But what he was doing, he was going to all the places that he remembered from his childhood on up, the places he had never seen and wanted to see, and he just absolutely took, I think it was two years, and did it. And along the way, he started doing rap sessions with college students. Just go up and sit on the edge of a table and talk to them and answer their questions. And they filled up one gymnasium after another every time he would agree to go to do one. So he had a sense and a feel about the fiber of our society, I think, uh, before a lot of people did. Is there any sport 
that you haven't covered that you wish you had covered? No, not really. Okay. I don't. I I, I turned down the uh, uh, hockey game at uh, at uh, Lake Placid because I, in the first place, I was never around hockey. Secondly, I certainly never played hockey. And third, I'd never been to a hockey game. <laughs> what the hell am I going to do out there trying to call a, an Olympic hockey game? Al Michaels had done hockey games, uh, when some anyway, uh, when he was working in Cincinnati doing baseball. And um, my reaction was Al can do it. He's the only one that's really truly qualified amongst our group. And I wanted to do the Haydn story because I thought the Haydn story was going to be a big story, and turned out it was. But um, so was the hockey. <laughs> Bigger. But I, I'm not sorry I didn't do Haydn. I love doing the Eric Haydn story. Eric Haydn is one of the extraordinary young people of my lifetime. I give you credit for that because if it was Howard Cosell, he would have pretended like he knew everything about hockey. <laughs> yeah, well, he would have that's invented why, the game. That's why they got a knob on that thing. You can turn it off. <laughs> How come you haven't written a book yet? Oh, I don't have anything to say. I don't know that. Uh, I. It's come up. It comes up about every six years. <laughs> Right now, there was there's a there's a, a pretty good push to try to get something going here. Where it's not going to be a book where you're you're punishing people or or telling uh, false stories or telling stories to make somebody look bad. Just just tell stories that if you can find enough that make you laugh. Oh, and maybe there'd be one or two in the course of a book that might make you think about the future. But um, I, I may still do it, but it's uh, probably not going to come until I'm I'm gone. It'll, somebody will open that locker box and my daughter will sell it to them. <laughs> It'll be post posthumously? Uh, I don't know. Probably. I don't know if I'm really willing to give up that much time. It's writing a book is hard. Yeah. And uh, especially if you're trying to say something. And I, uh, I'm not a philosopher, but I don't, I don't mind telling somebody why this was better than that was. I think. <laughs> well, the I other think thing the is about legends. You know, when you get to the point where you, people say, "Well, you're you're a legend." That must mean that you can say anything you want and nobody's going to bother you. <laughs> but if you write a book, there are all kinds of worms coming out of the woodwork. You know what I miss about the sports uh, radio today and newspapers and TV is you don't hear the stories like you used to. I mean, Ellie and I have interviewed 160 Hall of Famers, and I enjoy hearing the stories, whereas now it's all about today's game, today's game, but no one talks about the past. Well, that's that's true. That's true. Everything done in the past wasn't bad, was it? No, I mean, when you could sit down with Jim Brown and he talks to you for 30 minutes and you hear the stories, whereas people hear who Jim Brown is, but they don't really know about him. No, all I know is uh, the son of a gun was uh, walked on the golf course first time I ever saw him, teed it up and shot 71. <laughs> and it took $10 of my money. <laughs> But, uh, how how is your golf game these days? <laughs> but the um, I was you know you, one of my favorite stories of all stories in this thing going along was uh, we were doing Pepper Rod the year there was one year we had uh, coaches as commentators and uh, when they were when they were not coaching. They had, they had an off week, we'd use them, and they agreed to do it. And some of them were fine. That's how that's, that's how we found Frank Ball. And, uh, 
and that was the first year of Jim Lampley and Don Collison, sideline reporters. Anyway, we were down in, in Alabama and working at Old Legion Field, and there's a great big open space up the, on the top floor. And they'd give us that entire great big old room when we go there for a broadcast or telecast. And Pepper was the commentator, and uh, Chuck Howard was our producer. And uh, Chuck was also the vice president of production, and I thought a hell of a producer, really good. But um, um, he told Lampley uh, that Jim Mishner was there that day, and Jim had just had his uh, book Sports in America published. And it was quite a work that he he did. It. And uh, Lampley's, uh, Lampley's talking to him on the sideline during uh, the early part of the half, and. Uh, uh, Lampley said, well, where's the, ask him, where's the coach, best coaching done? And, and uh, Mishner says, well, I just finished two weeks with the Steelers, and I'm of the opinion that uh, that the best coaching is done at the professional level. Well, Pepper's sitting there looking at the television set and, and listening to this, and uh, he's, he's, when Mishner left and uh, Pepper stepped down from the stool he was on and kicked the stool as far as he could. He kicked a garbage can to the other side of the room. He looked like he was going to assault me and the cameraman both. I mean, it just became a black cloud. And I said to him, Pepper, we are not paying you all this money to come down here and kick the damn furniture around. Say something. <laughs> and I had uh, Chuck was uh, just in awe of, of uh, of what Mishner said, and didn't say much of anything. And I told Andy Sedaris, who was our director, and Andy's now going too, but uh, Andy gave me a, a belly button up shot of Pepper, nice tight shot of him. And uh, so we came out of the commercial, and there's Pepper all by himself on the screen. And he looked right in the camera and he said, I always liked Erskine Caldwell better myself. <laughs> I laughed for months about that. Did you have a that. did you have a favorite <laughs> did you have a favorite broadcast partner? No, I loved them all. They were all good people, all worked hard. Everybody had a quality that uh, made hanging around with them worthwhile. And they were all bright. And probably people who really, you know, work with their hands and, and what have you would not think this, but what we did in the television business was hard work. And what they do now is is hard work. It's it's not a it's not a lollipop trip. You bust your chops. Did you have These a favorite? These guys all jumped in there, and they and they really worked hard. They, you know, all of them did. And those who didn't didn't last long. Did you have a favorite uh, football coach to deal with? Oh, there were lots of them that I liked. Uh, of the more recent group, I'm particularly fond of Lloyd Carr. Love John McKay. I never will forget that line that uh, when the Trojans had played uh, Notre Dame and Notre Dame whacked them 51 to nothing in the case as they were all walking up the tunnel at the Coliseum and going to the locker room. McKay's parting uh, comment to his troops on that particular day was uh, uh, go in the locker room now and, and take your shower, boys, if you think you need it. And just kept on going. <laughs> uh, he was he was he was wonderful. He was a real wit. And David Nelson, who used to was over there at Delaware and invented the wing tee and all that kind of stuff, and became the dean of students and was the rules guru. He had a great wit, a, a very quiet, subtle sense of humor that. We were down in Jackson, Mississippi, at the old Heidelberg uh, Hotel, and and 
we were doing, I think, LSU and Ole Miss football game, and, and then Mississippi State was playing Alabama, something like that. But I got there kind of late at like 10 o'clock at night, went to bed, and I heard the scratching sound, scratching sound, scratching sound. So finally I got up and, and went to see what it was, and it was a cockroach in the bathtub. So I closed the door, and I went back to bed and slept a few hours, and, and we would go do the ball game. I'd go all toward to check out of the hotel on the way to do the game, and David had a glass in his hand, and I did something over the top of it. I didn't pay attention to it. And uh, he was right in front of me when we were checking out. And he takes the glass and uh, plops it down on the, on the uh, counter in front of the uh, hotel clerk. And he says, oh, by the way, I brought your mascot back. And he took, picked up the glass and it was a cockroach. <laughs> <laughs> I never forgot it. <laughs> I brought your mascot back. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you so much for your time. It was a pleasure talking to you. You're very welcome. Have a good day. Bye. Thank you, sir.